So we are going to start the first, the, the second morning session with a presentation from me. And I'll get to share with you some of our ideas and some data and results from my laboratory. And it's usually I like to start with thinking uh, for the motivation. Would you click on the slides, Jason? Of why we do what we do. And one big motivation for a lot of single cell analysis is the underlying heterogeneity between cells and tissues. And I think many single cell methods can analyze that. Uh, in particular, imaging methods are very powerful. And while single cell proteomics can certainly be used in that way, for many cases, it's not the most cost effective approach. Perhaps cell painting with high throughput microscopy is a better way to characterize cell heterogeneity. So when I think of single cell proteomics, we are really motivated by questions of why and how. What are the molecular mechanisms behind what we observe? What is the functional significance? Is this heterogeneity simply reflecting noisy bursty behavior in the cells? Or can we connect it to underlying biology? Can we build more causal mechanistic models? And one really fortunate aspect for single cell mass spectrometry as displayed in this diagram by Jason Dirks is that we can measure not only protein abundances, but there is a potential to measure protein conformations, activities, localization, and many, many additional features that are really important if we want to build and understand more mechanistic models. And I'm going to start by giving you a very quick overview of technologies, very speedy overview of older parts, a little bit delve more into the recent parts of the technology that's powering up these prospects. And then I'll spend a lot of my time on new biology that I think single cell proteomics is making accessible. So on the side of the technology here, I've outlined um, four main areas to which my laboratory has contributed. And instead of going very deeply, I'll give you the big picture view, focusing on the concepts. What, what, what are the main concepts and aims for each of these things that we have done? Of course, the first step of most biological analysis involves sample preparation. And on this front, we've gone through multiple generations of methods. And the first automated method that we developed was a multi-well based method from Harrison Speck. And we liked that method because it was very accessible, but ultimately we could prepare only a few hundred single cells in parallel. And we were very interested in increasing the throughput to many thousands of single cells, which led to the development of a second uh, of another generation method of, by Andrew Leduc of preparing single cells on glass surfaces. And this was very intentional, the choice of glass surfaces. We want it to be completely unconstrained so that we can design any kind of arrangement between our single cells into various groups. And so that we can make the droplets in which each single cell is prepared very small, ultimately to increase the density. The higher the density of the droplets, the more single cells we can prepare in parallel. And in the current generation of this technology, we can prepare a few thousand up to 3,000 single cells. And this has made mass spectrometry much more limiting than sample preparation. But what I'm going to tell you later in my talk is that we hope to make this sample prep much more limiting now because mass spec will be faster and we'll have to rethink how do we make it faster. And that is the sample preparation that was demonstrated as part of the workshops prior to, to the conference. And transitioning to ideas for mass spectrometry analysis, one of the first contributions that we made to this field is the introduction of isobaric carriers. And this is something that was already discussed a couple of times yesterday, so I'm not going to go into details other than say that the idea there was that when we do sequence identification of peptides, which is the challenging part, we can pull peptide fragments derived across multiple single cells and carrier material. And this made peptide sequence identification easier. And perhaps the most significant impact of this work on the field was that it started changing perceptions about the feasibility of single cell proteomics by mass spectrometry about what's possible. <laughs> 
And a number of other developments from my group were motivated by this observation. And it's, an ob it's a very, um, very important observation from our perspective, which is a measure for the ultimate sensitivity of mass spec instruments for detecting peptides, proteins from single cells. And what I'm showing here is that if we start with single cells and we analyze them with sensitive liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry, even if we inject just a single cell label free without anything else, we can detect many peptide-like features. Each of those corresponds to a specific sequence, to a specific molecular composition, and has many dozens or many hundreds and thousands of copies of that sequence. And we can see tens of thousands, lately hundreds of thousands of those peptide-like features. And we have always found this very important and gratifying observation because it tells us that the sensitivity of the technology, even older technology, is sufficient to detect many, many copies from tens, hundreds of thousands of peptides. Of course, that's insufficient. We're not interested in peptide-like features. Ultimately, we absolutely have to determine the sequences, but we have the material to begin with. And the question is, how do we come up with strategies? How do we innovate so that we can assign confident, reliable sequences to a large fraction of these peptide-like features in our instruments? And my laboratory has taken a couple of different approaches to that, uh, really inspired from that same observation of having more peptide-like features so that we can analyze if we analyze one of them at a time in a serial fashion. And one approach is let's focus the instruments on those peptide-like features that are most important, that correspond to peptides of interest, including post-translational modifications, such as proteolytically cleaved peptides, phosphorylated or otherwise modified peptides. And let's do this as efficiently as possible by doing real-time instrument control. And we implemented this using the prioritized framework, which of course applies not only to single cells, that is generally applicable framework to all mass spectrometry analysis of, of proteins. And what this framework allowed us is to achieve over 98% data completeness, while at the same time analyzing peptides, proteins of interest, while at the same time increasing quantitative accuracy, and while at the same time increasing the depth of the protein coverage. And that's one approach to dealing with having more MS, more peptide-like features when we can analyze one at a time. The other way, of course, is let's analyze many of them at a time, open the windows wide. But as we do that, the approaches that existed at the time did not allow to efficiently multiplex in the space of samples or single cells. We could only analyze, analyze one cell at a time, and we wanted more. So we developed this approach of parallelizing both at the level of single cells and at the level of fragmenting peptides. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this approach. Um, and by the way, if you look at, at this diagram here of parallelizing on both axes, you might be able to figure out why we called our institute parallel squared. The name is inspired by this, by this diagram, but our hope here is that by analyzing in parallel multiple samples and multiple peptides, we can get multiplicative increase in the number of highly quantitative data points. And the aspiration is not to compromise. Yesterday we had a discussion, do we analyze more single cells or do we go for deeper proteome coverage? We want it all. We want to keep the proteome coverage as high as it is, or even deeper for label-free analysis, while at the same time increasing the throughput without compromising the quality of, of the data. And one very important observation here that I want to emphasize is the number of peptide molecules that we can count from a single cell. That is millions. In small single cells, it would be low millions. In large single cells, large millions. But this number gets us, gets us in a regime where we can start thinking not only about detecting, but also about quantifying peptides and proteins. And that is important part of my aspiration to, to build more mechanistic models and go beyond just describing heterogeneity. 
Uh, and we think we can push far beyond the current level of plexing that we have to continue increasing throughput conditioned, and I'll repeat conditioned, on preserving the high quantitative accuracy and the depth of the proteome coverage. And we have ideas of how we can further build upon uh, PlexDIA, taking advantage of some of its features. For example, if we use mustads that don't alter retention times, and not all mustads have that property, some are deuterated and alter retention time, but if we use mustads that don't change elution profiles, then we have coeluting peptides as shown here by those two peptide ions. And the coincidence of the apices for the same peptide labeled with different mask tags is very high, much, much higher than what we can possibly achieve by matching peptides across different runs. As shown here by this data acquired by Jason Dirks, we have about a tenfold higher precision in retention times of both precursors and their fragments. And this precision translates into more statistical power for discriminating between correct and incorrect propagations of sequence uh, identifications. And of course, the development of this whole idea of multiplexing with PlexDA was in part motivated by our interest in extending ideas from the isobaric carrier now to isotopologous carrier so that we can enhance sequence identification. Uh, and we have thought about this for many years and have found it quite hard, actually. There are many, many aspects of doing this properly that are challenging. And we have intentionally not published because we did not want to, to mislead the community with something that is half-baked and not yet ready for prime time. Uh, but Luke Curry has gotten to a point where we think we can get quantitation. And one way to benchmark this is by applying the familiar mixed species standards, mixing species into known ratios. And then we can measure whether the measured ratios correspond to the mixing ratios. And indeed, that is what Luke observes in this data set when using a 10 cell carrier, while at the same time, Again, increasing the depth of protein coverage without compromising accuracy of quantitation. Though I do want to caution that this doesn't work on all instrument platforms, at least not in our hands. And there are significant caveats to be kept in mind. In fact, some of the work out there in the literature is likely to be highly problematic. And we are working on writing guidelines uh, for, for how this can be employed fruitfully. Uh, and in the meantime, before we have published those, you can find uh, these guidelines for isobaric carriers uh, that Harrison and I wrote up and published a few years ago useful because many of the issues are similar. They relate to capacity of ion traps and, and other technical aspects that are even more limiting for isotopologous carrier. But nonetheless, relevant discussion you can find in this article. And now I want to switch to um, another recent uh, development uh, that we, we are very excited about. And that is the creative uses of trapped ion mobility mass spectrometry. And this plot that I told you that inspired us so many years ago of detecting many peptide-like features in orbit traps, this is even better on TIMSOF instruments. We see many, many hundreds of thousands of peptide-like features, and that's wonderful. But in our first Im implementation of team stuff instruments uh, in the Plex DA paper highlighted here, we used multiple MS2 frames, which resulted in relatively slower duty cycles. And relatively slower duty cycles means fewer points across the peaks. So we wanted to improve this. And we improved it based on the idea that each slice in ion mobility space corresponds to a slice in M over Z space. And therefore, if one is analyzing the data correctly, we can use a single MS2 frame to give us all the information that we need for identifications. And this is what Vadim Dimitrov has made possible by developing an, an analytical methods for, uh, for these data, slice passive. And now we can have our duty cycles being two times faster. And this is how the data look like. Um, uh, these plots are made by Jason Dirks with data acquired by uh, Luke Curry. 
And here we have these very sharp peaks. They're only a second or two, thanks to ion optics columns, providing good separation. And nonetheless, we have dozens of scans at both MS1 and MS2 level. And this is particularly important if we want to have accurate quantification and capture lowly abundant precursors close to, the, uh, to their elution apices. Does it matter? That's a theory. We want to have more points per peak, but do we have empirical evidence that that's the case? And yes, we do. So this is uh, a plot that you can find in a preprint from uh, Georg Wallman. He developed a very useful uh, application for displaying data interactively. And here we can see that as the number of survey scans decreases, so do the measured precursor intensities because we are much less likely to sample peptides close to their elution apices. So what about helping us with analyzing small primary cells? We find that indeed, as we would expect theoretically, that high frequency of scanning really improves identification rates with very small cells, such as primary T cells, primary monocytes, and so on. As you can see here with those two, uh, with, with those bars reflecting analysis using standard DI passive or using slice passive. And again, that improvement comes from having higher frequency of scanning and much more efficient use of the ions. Good. So these are some updates about the technology. And now comes the part that I'm really excited about. Is this thing any good for biology? I think it is. And I'll share with you very briefly a number of small examples where we have used uh, single cell protein measurements in biological projects. The first one that I'm going to tell you about is motivated by questions of understanding how first cells become different in development. So long time ago, each one of you was a single zygote. And then that zygote split into two cells and two cells split into four cells. And we don't actually know when those cells begin to be different in a biologically meaningful way. There is some evidence that perhaps differences emerge here from functional measurements, but it has been really difficult to associate molecular features with those functional measurements. In fact, if you measure transcriptomes in two and four cell stage embryos, as many groups have done with single cell RNA sequencing, very few transcripts differ. Maybe a couple show small differences, but nothing major. It's really hard to tell, are they different? But if you measure proteins at two cell stage, early and late, we find that hundreds of proteins differ very significantly and systematically to an extent that Alex Patelsky can now classify each blastomere as either being alpha or being beta. Good, so that's some heterogeneity, that's systematic, that's consistent, but does it matter? Does it matter for the biology of, of development? And we can ask this question by doing a careful manipulation and taking those two cell stage embryos and separating them into two cells. Then we analyze one blastomere to identify is it alpha, is it beta, and let the other one develop. And as it develops into an embryo, we can analyze the embryo and see how many epiblast cells it has. Is it a healthy embryo? Is it not? What is the developmental potential of that other sister blastomere? And we were delighted to see that what we had measured with mass spectrometry wasn't just noise, but in fact, was able to predict the developmental potential. And in particular, we found that beta uh, blastomeres are significantly more likely to give rise to viable embryos with large number of epiblast cells. Why is this happening? What's the mechanism that drives the difference between alpha and beta blastomeres? We believe that's mostly protein degradation and protein transport, in part because this happens early on before the major zygotic genome activation in part because we find very strong enrichment of protein ligases and other uh, proteins associated with protein degradation and transport. And uh, as one might expect, the, these, make, these differences that we have found initially from mouse embryos are strongly recapitulated in human embryos. So everything that I told you 
likely applies to your early lives as well. What first made your cells different probably involved a lot of protein degradation in transport rather than differential transcription. So switching gears a little bit and picking up pace on showing you some vignettes of biological applications, uh, I have been excited for a long time by the possibility of interpreting protein covariation. And I've written a couple of perspectives on that. I think that highly precise, highly quantitative data can be useful to constrain different classes of models as illustrated on this diagram by making very, very few assumptions. But does it work? Does it actually help us interpret real single cell mass spectrometry data? And here is one example from the work of Saad Khan, a PhD candidate in my group, and that's focused on epithelial mesenchymal transition. It's a highly studied, very important phenomenon that is relevant both to normal development and to cancer metastasis when adherent epithelial cells become motile and start moving. And this transition is associated with profound rearrangement of the cytoskeletal apparatus because you need a stationary cell to become motile cell. And when you just look naively at the system of differentiating epithelial cells to become mesenchymal, we observed something very interesting. We saw that some of the well-quantified proteins that participate in cellular motion, such as a tubulin beta chain and the protein involved in, in organizing microfilaments, change their correlations very significantly. They're inversely correlated in epithelial cells. Their correlation becomes, they become decorrelated uh, at, at the medium time point, and they become strongly positively correlated in the mesenchymal cells. And while this correlation is changing, if you pay attention to the abundances of these proteins, they're not. These proteins don't change in abundance between epithelial to mesenchymal cells. What really changes is how they co-vary together. And that's an example of observation that is quite essentially enabled by measuring proteins in single cells. We couldn't have inferred this correlation from any other data. Now, switching gears and pushing forward, now I'm sharing some data from Andrew Leduc, who studied the emergence of drug resistance in melanoma cells. And we were able to quantify and interpret covariation within clusters of cells. So what Andrew was able to do is he identified a cluster that corresponded to cells that are primed for drug resistance and another cluster of cells that are not yet primed for drug resistance, but within the clusters, even within clusters of the same cell type, we have a lot of protein covariation as shown here with, uh, uh, with a couple of proteins. And if we look systematically, which are the proteins that are positively and negatively correlated to each other, we find that they correspond to modules. And in this case here, we are showing modules involved in different metabolic processes. And what we see is that those cells likely on their path to becoming primed for drug resistance are changing the degree of their reliance on different types of metabolism for deriving energy. Now, switching gears again and moving to another example of interpreting single cell protein measurements in biological context. Of course, we can look not only at covariation between proteins, but we can look at covariation between proteins and their corresponding transcripts. And this example comes from the early work of uh, Harrison Specht on scope two, uh, when he was still a PhD student in my group. And here we see an example of a gene for which the RNA and the protein products strongly cover it together, suggesting that perhaps there isn't much post-transcriptional regulation. But if we look at another example, we see that for P53, there is no positive correlation between RNA and protein, perhaps not surprisingly. We have a lot of prior knowledge that P53 is regulated primarily by degradation. Uh, but we also see something interesting. We see that P53 protein levels correlate to downstream targets of the transcription factor, while the messenger RNA levels do not. And this directly indicates that the protein is much more biologically informative for the transcription factor activity than its associated messenger RNA. How about this protein? Is there post-transcriptional regulation? I think it's really hard to know. The only way to tell 
is to know how much noise there is in the measurement because there is some kind of correlation here, but clearly very noisy correlation. And we can say, oh, there is post-transcriptional regulation. Yes, but look at RNA. We're counting a single RNA molecule here, maybe two here. It's really noisy data dominated by count statistics. We don't have the nice 5 million molecules counted with mass spectrometry. We have near thousands of molecules counted. So we really have to know how much measurement noise we have of all types, sample preparation, mass spec measurement, data processing, all of these sources of noise have to be factored in for us to have a reasonable chance of making a reliable conclusion if there post-transcription regulation. And Alex Franks and Andrew LeDuc and Megan sitting over there at the back have been thinking very, very hard with us about these questions and working on developing principled models that can help us determine how much of what we measure is signal that we can trust and how much of it is noise that we should ignore so that we don't make fools of ourselves. And I'll give you some sense of how that might work with an example of measuring the same protein ratios with two very different methods in two biological replicates. And this is work done by Andrew LeDuc where he is analyzing melanoma cells using either prioritized scope and doing quantitation on reporter ions at MS2 level, or using plex DIA and doing quantification of precursor levels, and doing this on cells grown months apart, different biological replicates. And what Andrew found is that the correlation was there, that those two methods did not measure exactly the same protein levels, but they found similar fold changes. And we can use measurements of such different orthogonal methods to increase our confidence. And perhaps some of the noise here is due to sampling relatively few single cells in this smaller cluster. And of course, we can take this one step further, not just estimating reliability for our statistical rigor, but we can use those different methods when we have interesting biological conclusions and we want to test the hypothesis. Are we seeing an artifact of our measurement or are we seeing interpretable biology? And in those cases, it's really useful to be able to plot on top of each other data acquired with those different methods and see, do they line up? Do they not line up? And in this case, we see this gradient of protein variation as melanoma cells become primed to be drug resistant. And this is recapitulated by using those two very different methods, which gave us confidence that what we measure is not si simply reflecting an artifact of our mass spectrometry analysis. And here I come to perhaps the most important part of my presentation for today, which is the community. How do we use all of the wonderful work that many of you have presented and shared at this meeting to help each other, to strengthen our community? And I believe that part of that is sharing data and methods in a way that makes it very easy for others to reproduce what we have done and extend it further, not only repeat, but build upon it. And because of that, we put in substantial amount of effort in sharing all of our data sets. And if you're interested in any of the work that they mentioned, the chances are you can find the data and download it from this website. And we have also worked together with, with the entire community. Many of you who are here have pitched in to help in developing an initial set of recommendations for performing single cell proteomic experiments by, by mass spectrometry. And they've heard by many colleagues that they find this resource useful, which is delightful to me. And I hope that many of you will consider contributing to the second generation because we consider those being initial recommendations. They're not, not set in stone. Our field is young, evolves, and as we learn more, we can update and make those recommendations more useful to, to the broader community. And I also want to share another community resource, which is a new nonprofit research institute that we started uh, in January, Parallel Square Technology Institute, uh, that's uh, philanthropically funded from Schmidt Futures. And it's an institute that is very much motivated by big biology questions, but it is powered by mass spectrometry technology, in particular mass spectrometry methods motivated by the proof of principle demonstration of PLEX-DIA, 
where we want to continue to scale throughput without compromising depth or accuracy. And we hope to provide lots of resources that can be shared with the community. And I, I would encourage you to get in touch, learn more about our initiative and start benefiting from it. I think the first tangible benefit for the community that I can report are the workshops that we had just before the conference. For the first time ever, we could offer to a few dozen people the opportunity to have hands-on experience in doing sample prep, which would have been difficult to do here in my academic lab at Northeast but having PTI, parallel squared, made it possible. And I would really like to use this institute as, uh, as an empowering platform for the whole community. Everything that they shared has been part of a very fun and collaborative effort in my lab here at, at Northeastern. And I mentioned the students who directly contributed to the project. So just quickly show them here. Perhaps we've already met many of them at the conference, but this is Harrison Specht, uh, Sad Khan, Jason, Luke, Alex Petelski, Andrew, and Gray Huffman. I'll stop here and I'll be happy to answer questions. <laughs> uh, I, I thought that output data cell last year uh, result was really interesting. And I was wondering how, what was that concept of an alpha and a beta cell already existing in the field prior to your work? Or is that a concept you were able to unveil with the proteome? That's the first question. And then the second one is, uh, since you mentioned that mRNA methods can distinguish those cells, and how many other settings do you think were missing this? Thank you. I'll briefly repeat your questions for the online audience. The first question that Sabrina Spencer asked is whether we knew about alpha and beta cells uh, prior to our work. No, they did not exist. We introduced the definition of alpha and beta cells. People did not have a reliable way to find the difference between those cells, and therefore there was no terminology. Alpha and beta is terminology that we are introducing uh, in a forthcoming paper that should be published in Nature soon, we hope. Uh, your second question is, how many other examples do we know of when there, there is more heterogeneity that we are not detecting if we only measure messenger RNA uh, levels and not proteins? Uh, I think that early development is going to be a case that is enriched in those examples because there we know the transcription is not yet active while many things can happen at the level of protein degradation and remodeling. So I think if the question is merely in identifying clusters, my guess is that in many cases, single cell RNA sequencing or various imaging methods are going to find most of the clusters, maybe not some subtle differences. There are cases where they don't find them, but I think that's not their main limitation. In my mind, in my view, the main limitation is interpretation. I think many single cell methods can describe the different subpopulations in different clusters. But I think we really struggle, many methods struggle to meaningfully assign those to biological functions in the beautiful way that you exemplified yesterday. I think that's, that's, that's a great example for all single cell omics to, to aspire to get, to, to have, at least in my view, in my mind, in my worldview, to have more mechanistic interpretation of um, single cell omic measurements. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing all the work and the efforts. It's, it's actually very cool to see also this parallel squared nonprofit. And I think we were missing it actually in nonprofits in our discussion in the panel. It's really cool to see another dimension. So um, I have two questions. Uh, one is about um, the throughput. So what do you think are the breakthroughs that would allow it to uh, sequence much many more cells, right? And this is one. And the second question is, what do you think are the challenges, but also the pathway towards single cell phosphoproteomics? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Theo. So the first question on the side of throughput, the short, simple answer is many more mass tags that allow us to preserve the depth of proteome coverage and the accuracy while increasing throughput. The big expense for us is instrument time. Mass tags are pennies. They're very, very inexpensive compared to instrument time. So if we have a 100-plex DIA set, which we can analyze on our current gradients of 10 minutes, we can get into the regime where it becomes very affordable and practical to measure millions of single cells. And that's one of the ambitions of Parallel Squared to develop much higher plex tags. And as we develop them, we are going to make those available to the community. And ultimately, initially, it's part of collaborations, ultimately commercially, because I think that's the only way to really make the technology widely accessible and sustainable. Uh, your second question, Theo, is about uh, phosphorylation, measuring phosphorylation. I think that's very feasible. In fact, if we go to our very first data sets from 2017, 2018, 2019, and simply do a variable search for phosphorylation of our shotgun data, we can find individual phosphorylated peptides. We can find a few hundred. We can find ubiquitulated peptides. And now if we use Plex DIA, if we use prioritized scope, we can tune in the mass specs specifically on precursors corresponding to various modifications and increase sensitivity 10, 100 fold. That's not sufficient for all post-translationally modified peptides. But I think we are at a point where one can certainly design a good study, well-powered study, looking at accessible post-translational modifications that can be both quantified and interpreted. And for me, that last part is very important. I think if I just wanted to show a thousand phosphopeptides measured in single cells, that's the sort of thing that we could have done quite a while ago. In fact, we sort of did with using phosphoenriched carriers. But most of the most of these phosphocytes don't have well-defined biological functions. We don't know which kinases phosphorylate them, and therefore our ability to use them for biology would be limited. It would be more of a technical benchmark. And I appreciate those, but at this point, I'm really focused on trying to, to focus more on biological questions. And I think we are getting there just to to be clear on that answer, I think that there are technologies that one can use to measure biologically interpretable PTMs. Uh, more questions? Uh, hi. Um, I should apologize if this is a naive question, but uh, I'm not from the, um, the field of mass suspect. So I was wondering, uh, you mentioned about the cell type differences and how you can address this using this method. We know that a lot of these cell type differences is not because of because um, the level of expression of the proteins, but isoform differences in different cell types. So uh, Dr. Um, Kalaher mentioned it yesterday. So for someone from outside of my suspect, um, subject. I am wondering what is the difference between your method and what is the and um, Dr. Callaher's method. Oh, oh the, the big difference is that we first start by using a protease to digest proteins to peptides, and all that we analyze are peptides. What Professor Callaher is doing is he's analyzing intact proteins that have not been digested, and that is clearly. Uh, providing the information that is more biologically relevant, the full-length intact protein. But this is very challenging to do and to achieve the depth of protein um, coverage that we can with analyzing peptides and to have the number of, uh, of copies being counted. So we are very much interested in quantitative accuracy and precision. And the methods that we're using are geared towards maximizing the copy number of, of ions that we are measuring. So what, what they showed today for a few millions is something that we are reasonably happy with, but not, not entirely. I want more. And in fact, uh, Brooker is introducing new technology of uh, wider capillaries, which is going to increase the efficiency of delivering ions to instruments. And Luke Curry is going to show that. I think it's wonderful. And there would be more discussions at SMS on that. Uh, and I, I, I see that as being a big upward trajectory for both the intact proteoform analysis that Neil Callagher showed and what we are doing of 
increasing the efficiency of delivering peptides, proteins to mass spec instruments so that we can get uh, many more copies measured. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? How are we doing on time? I'm very happy to answer many questions. I love discussions. I just want to make sure we also stay on time. Maybe time for one more question. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. I have just a technical question of a mass spec. So many of you use a team stop for single cell proteomics, but we have FAMES and Orbitrap Eclipse. So, um, you know, FAMES boosts the signal of low abundance, but in this, <laughs> my experience is that we could not get enough data point with PIA with the FAMES because the FAMES have required switching time. So, but without FAMES, we cannot get the signal. So how can... Do you have any? You can, yeah, absolutely. A lot of the data that they showed today are generated from QExactive Classic Model 2010. So that's a really old instrument, and I'm very proud of that. I'm not apologetic. I love the new instruments. Team stuff instruments are awesome. Now we have a few in my lab. We want to get more. We love the new instruments that Therma is introducing. We played with those, and Luke is going to show some data. But instruments, in my mind, don't make the difference between being able to do the work at all or not. You can certainly use older instruments to obtain useful uh, protein data that can be used in biological studies. The data are going to be better. The coverage is going to be deeper with team stuff SCP. It's a wonderful instrument, by all means, if you can get it. But specifically to your question, FAMES is not important. So we use QExactive Classic without FAMES. We obtain beautiful data. You can certainly turn off FAMES and use the instrument without FAMES. You can also tune FAMES to make it work. There are certainly examples, and in fact, Ryan Kelly has a paper published on that topic of improving analysis by using FAMES on Orbitrap instruments. And also Ryan shared, shared that it's actually quite hard to tune in FAMES just the right way to get that result. Uh, but if you don't want to deal with all the tuning part, just remove it from the chain and you can get beautiful data as well from arbitrap instruments uh one one more question maybe uh, wonderful talk uh, you know and definitely uh, look look was looking forward to so uh, you know my question is more uh, uh, asking for advice relevant to what work we do at cdc and so uh, we have uh, influenza uh, as our you know uh, model where we look at uh, pbmcs mainly immune responses and so the graph which you showed uh, you show pbmcs are at the bottom so really low so do you think going forward it would be feasible to look at a single cell level with PBMCs and you know what what's your advice on that? It's certainly feasible. It's challenging. Right. So yesterday in my opening remarks and trends, I highlighted that as being one of the trends. It is certainly feasible. It is certainly challenging. And you'll just have to accept that you can quantify fewer proteins than in HeLa cells. On the other hand, you can probably learn more than what you can learn from analyzing HeLa cells. So and, and, and PBMCs are challenging for single cell RNA sequencing. Many single cell RNA sequencing can obtain um, a few hundred, maybe a few thousand unique molecular identifiers from, from those small cells. So they're challenging for any one method. And I certainly believe that they can be analyzed with mass spectrometry. Uh, 